Kia ora, talofa, namaste, haere mai, and welcome to our Monday niche cast. We are here to dissect some Aotearoa sporting matters from the weekend, and we'll take it back a day, because the Black Caps did defeat England on Friday morning, and of course the Black Caps, I think they're playing tonight against the Netherlands, so that's what we're here to do. We've also got a bit of White Ferns, they are playing cricket. Uh, a little bit of a basketball focus and of course we'll go football with some national league and flying kiwi stuff as well we are from the niche cagecom we've got big deep dives into the aotearoa kiwis the aotearoa kiwi ferns got a uh, written thing about the black caps win over england on the website at the moment as well and there's also a wellington phoenix woman deep dive that you can check in with to prepare for the Wellington Phoenix woman in the A-League woman. I still think they should just do like WA-League or A-League, you know, like A-League woman is a, it's a bit of a, it's not NRLW, like let's just say that, you know, just crisp. There is ALW and ALM, I suppose, you know, yeah, they, they tried to combine them so that the women's A-League wasn't being just completely ignored by the, um, uh, the the established uh well the australian sporting establishment basically which has a hard enough time taking the a-league seriously they weren't doing it for the a-league women so they're trying to you know package them i i get the i get the intent um there is a more succinct way to say it though isn't there <laughs> the al dub the wellington phoenix are competing in the al dub this season another season and uh hopefully this season's a lot better but hopefully uh you can prepare for this far better season coming up with our deep dive on our website, the news-cache.com. And of course, Monday means we will be sending out our newsletter via Substack with all sorts of notes, wrinkles, bits and pieces about Kiwi sport. We write paragraphs just for that newsletter. Then you're getting the podcast in that newsletter. And of course, all the links to our website as well. So it's basically the go-to spot for the niche cache and it's sending up straight to you via substack the niche cache dot substack dot com and for anyone feeling generous anyone who's enjoying the mahi you can upgrade to a paid substack subscription to access our subscriber podcast or you can join the patreon fano patreon.com forward slash el niche cache and access that subscriber podcast as well I reckon we'll probably do it on Wednesday again and we'll be going deep into the Black Caps again. Uh, hopefully after they have defeated Netherlands. So of course, subscriber podcast, we are putting a big focus on the Black Caps during the World Cup. And that will fit nicely between the Netherlands game and then the Black Caps playing against Bangladesh on Friday. So check that out. We do touch on other topics as well. We try to spread it around. And of course, the whole point of the subscriber podcast is for those who support us straight up the guts to chime in and partake in the podcast. You decide what topics we want to talk about. We'll talk about them. At the moment, we're just focusing on the black caps. So that's what it is for the subscriber podcast available for the Patreon Fano and anyone with a paid Substack subscription. They're the easiest ways to support and fund the niche cache and get a bit of a vip situation going you can also make a sporadic donation via buy me a coffee as well if that's your buzz or you can just enjoy the yarns enjoy the cordero tell a friend do all the uh 2023 stuff like subscribe and all that other great stuff of the interwebs it all we all appreciate it um there's various options for you to contribute chime in and support the niche cache as well we'll start our podcast today with a dose of mindfulness and we've got a dose coming all the way from ancient greece today from mr hippocrates who i looked him up to see if he was to blame for the word hypocrite which doesn't seem to be the case he is however the uh the bloke who the hippocratic oath is named after which is still, you know, fundamental part of the medical profession to this day. And this is a medical bit of mindfulness, which says, let food be with thy medicine and medicine be thy food. Mm. 
not sure if you want to have like a whole bunch of medicine for dinner, but no, but it depends what the medicine is, right? I think he's basically saying like, um, you are what you eat sort of, but also like, um, find, I don't know if you think of it from like, if you consider medicine to be like healthy eating, for example, to be a form of medicine, food is something you have to eat anyway. And it's something that most people enjoy doing is, is eating something food. It's like finding a way to make your medicine be that, um, like to be, uh, I don't know. Um, well, this actually, the, when, where I found it was actually stemming from a conversation we had off mic last week about, um, uh, what, what would you call it? Um, there's, I can't remember what it's called, that little pepper plant thing. Hot um, pito. that's the one. And we're talking about that and kawakawa and some of these kind of things. If you think about it from that point of view, like that is food and it is medicine. And because it is uh, medicine that you can eat as food, it's medicine that doesn't taste like medicine. And therefore, it's medicine that you actually eat and use and get the benefits of. And finding ways to make those two things interchangeable, I think, is what old mate's getting at there. You know, finding ways to... Um, uh, it's like the spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down saying as well, isn't it? But in this case, you not have to sweeten it because the medicine actually is the food. The The medicine is already out there. Um, obviously, don't like skip your chemotherapy to, to eat pepper plants or whatever, but do that as well. I'm sure it works. When you like, oh, like obviously uh, indigenous populations don't need reminding of this, but the old, uh, no. <laughs> the half Pakia, half Palangi method of colonization and then completely diminishing the local medicine seems absolutely ridiculous but of course the half pakia half palangi population they do think they know everything so i'm not surprised that they came in swinging with uh, all sorts of niggly stuff as well as like oh you guys have like medicines that actually fix and cure things well we don't want it <laughs> it does seem a bit weird um have you tried leeches <laughs> musical jam we're going to drop a little bit of musical jam because the uh earl sweatshirt alchemist collaboration voir dire got to say that with some sort of accent i believe voir voir dire voir, is it dire voir dire voir dire it'll be voir because it's like french i think but i don't know where how to... however you say voir it <laughs> it is exquisite music um the alchemist production is absolutely ridiculous it's an interesting it's not a juxtaposition because they are very similar projects um the faith is a rock produced by the alchemist with mike and earl sweatshirt that was really cool and that was i liked it a lot for some reason the earl sweatshirt um collaboration with alchemist the latest one feels a bit sharper a bit more exquisite and i absolutely love it i love faith as a rock as well you got wiki you got mike two new york rappers uh doing their slow-mo thing over the alchemist production but yeah for what dire is a is the thought the word that kept coming to mind was exquisite and whether it's like you got a couple of vince staples uh features that always go down well but the uh the vin skelly track that it's got a video an official video it's just earl sweatshirt over top like pure exquisitism from the alchemist if that's a word what's your musical jam well i did i did hear that one a couple weeks ago i think it leaked a bit early and i, I had to listen to that i'm not sure if it's exactly the same because sometimes these dudes just like um release an album on a streaming thing then take it down then release a different version of the same album and then <laughs> You, know, you get a few different ones out in public before you get the final edition. So I better double check that. Um, but well, I, who cares? I, I like the, the exquisite, one that's, exquisite backs up. Yeah, the one that's released now is exquisite. That's who. That's all that matters, you know. Yeah, well, I'm saying is the one I heard on a leak the same as the one that's released now. It's but I, you know, the, the exquisite still stands. So we'll, we'll see. I thought from that one, the thing that stood out was just like immaculate sampling from Alchemist is to be expected but also still you know still the case um on top of that 
uh, I'm quite excited. Mermaidens, local uh, sort of um, psych garage rockish kind of band. It's just one of the few local bands that really crosses over into their kind of like um, a lot of that uh, uh, like Californian stuff that I listen to a lot, like OCs and Ty Siegel and, and folks like that. I could imagine Mermaidens playing on the same like festival bill as some of those bands. They got a couple new singles, new album coming out. Very, very keen for that one. Um, uh what are they? there's there is an album jukebox that'll be up now so we'll we'll chuck out our sort of little recommendations from whatever came out in the last week um margo silka was a one of the albums i had on there and also they they did this um one of my absolute favorite bands of all time is the replacements and they did this remix of their album tim which is from i don't know mid 80s and because it was done in the mid 80s and because it was replacements who were notoriously like um self-sabotaging like they didn't care they were they came out of the sort of uh, midwestern punk scene and they uh, didn't take themselves seriously enough they were seeing you know, a few addiction issues in the band and you know had had issues with some of like the obviously the longevity of their band wasn't always going to last but then you get with some of their albums it's just like there were three different producers because people came in couldn't make it work someone else comes in can't make it work another guy comes in and finishes it without the band's input and it, what you get is a little bit of a mess on top of some of the best songs you've ever heard they did this remix of of their album which is called tim because i read the there's a great biography about the band which you read and they were just like what do we name the album and someone was like i don't know tim <laughs> so they named it tim um I'm straight, no, I was just, I was going to say I wonder if it came out the same year as Tim Salvi was born but I don't think it did I think it's a little bit older than him but maybe Tim Salvi's named after that album who knows but the the remix of that album is bloody like revelatory they've cleaned everything up it sounds normal you can hear the instruments properly mixing with each other the songs were already amazing it was already a legendary album and now it's just so clean and precise and fresh and it sounds like it could have come out yesterday and it's unreal how they did that it's the second time a replacements album's got the remix thing because there was another one of their later ones which uh, had similar thing which isn't quite as good of an album but sounded a whole lot better when they when you heard it in the in the cleaned up version they did that for for tim as well which is wild it's unreal like then nearly 40 years later an album suddenly sounds new again like that it's uh pretty wild i can they they can just do that like <laughs> they can just go in there and clean it up like that also, do want to shout out the um, Court Inside Five Star Shag Court Inside up and coming Kiwi band, pretty funky music, and owners of one of my favorite lines of the past month or so. Honey, can you roll me a durry? <laughs> beautiful, beautiful Kiwi uh, music and poetry, and of course, My favorite lines of the last month or so were on the Ramfilly Shield. Very good. <laughs> and of course the black caps offered pure kiwi cricketing excellence in their defeat over england which was a moment to savor for the niche cage because we have been very positive about the, about the black caps our last podcast we actually poked fun at some of the expectation and description of how this world cup might pan out for the black caps and we're here after the first game of the World Cup, just uh, basking in the glow of our perception and our reading and our assessment of Black Caps cricket, all of which could change tonight when they do face the Netherlands. Like if they, if the Black Caps lose against Netherlands and Bangladesh, where well, they got after that, you know, some India, yeah, Afghanistan. Like, yeah, well, uh, that will be an issue, and the Black Caps will. Uh, they might suck by that point. But at the moment, they just absolutely destroyed England. It's a couple of days ago, for anyone who doesn't know, Black Caps bowled first. England scored 282 for nine off their 50 overs. Um, there were only Trent Bolt, Matt Henry, and Mitchell Santner as the leading bowlers. Hold that thought. And then the Black Caps just came out and demolished England. The Black Caps won this game with no Kane Williamson or Tim Southey. I also found it interesting that Lockie Ferguson was thrown up as a notable absentee with his back injury. And I, like if Lockie Ferguson's healthy while Tim Southey is unavailable, I can see Lockie Ferguson being a first 11 cricketer. But 
Those who listen to our podcast and read our work on our website, the case.com, you know Lockie Ferguson is not in good form. You know Lockie Ferguson struggled this year for the Black Caps and ODI cricket. You know his last few years have been a bit mediocre. Basically, since the last World Cup, when he was a first 11 bowler and kind of one of the best ODI bowlers in the world, Lockie Ferguson is uh, he's kind of gone downhill since then. And of course, the IPL earlier this year is aligned with Lockie Ferguson's Black Caps mahi. Like, it wasn't very good. So you know that Lockie Ferguson isn't necessarily a certified first 11 bowler. Um, so I'm not putting Lockie Ferguson as like, oh, the Black Caps were missing Tim Southey, Kane Williamson, and Lockie Ferguson. No. The Black Caps were just missing Tim Southey and Kane Williamson, and they still demolished England. I've got a few insights that I did cover in my written yarn, but I just I'll, I'll rattle off some insights here. So I do think the Black Caps are the best fielding team at the World Cup, for sure. That is certified. That is a fact. And I also think the Black Caps, like this is hand in hand with the best uh, fielding team. The Black Caps have the best athletes. Like the England team, just seeing them there in the field against each other, the Black Caps are way better athletes than England. I think they're fitter, they're faster, they're stronger, and I don't think any other team shares that athleticism like the Black Caps, and we've covered that a lot through our subscriber podcast and the uh, all our podcasts is just the work the Black Caps do with Chris Donaldson, their strength and conditioning guru. You got stories about Trent Bolt, Neil Wagner just steaming up Mount Monganui. You got Kane Williamson making a miraculous recovery. These dudes are all highly trained athletes. Like to be in the Black Caps, you've got to be a good athlete. You've got to be a good fielder. Rajan Ravindra is the new player in the team. He's a mover. He's a shaker. Good athlete. Good fielder. That's the standard of being a Black Cap and. Then you've got the X-Factor athletes like Glenn Phillips and Mitchell Santner in the field as well. So I think in this game, like, because everyone thinks like England, they're a good fielding team. They're the best white ball team in the world. They're like, I was reading a story about how England are managing their seam bowlers. <clears throat> and all the work, all the investment, all the, the data, the facts, the figures about their training, their working loads, their strength, their power, their size, all this stuff. They're not as good athletes as New Zealand. <laughs> So I think that was hammered home, and I don't see any other team sharing that athleticism that the Black Caps have. I think it's a sneaky little thing to watch out for. There was a lot of talk about the part-timers bowling for the Black Caps. Rajan Ravindra is not a part-timer. Rajan Ravindra is a certified all-rounder. He bowled the most overs of spin for Wellington in the Plunkett Shield last year. Peter Young husband was the only spinner for for Wellington to bowl more overs than Ravindra, and it was only one over. Across all three formats, Rajan Ravindra was the busiest spinner for Wellington, and he's bowled over 70 overs this year in ODI cricket for the Black Caps, his first year of ODI cricket. He is not a part-timer. He is a 10-over second spinner, if they're not playing East Sodi. If they are playing East Sodi, you've got three spinners who are bowling 10 overs. Yeah, sure, Jimmy Neesham. But Jimmy Neesham's in the team as an all-rounder. And if you've been paying attention, Glenn Phillips is in this team as an all-rounder as well. In the purest sense, because he's the best fielder, he bowls a bit, and he's a really good batter. He is a tremendous all-round cricketer. So I can see how other people look at this and they're like, oh my God, the Black Caps only had three specialist bowlers and three part-time bowlers bowling 20 overs. What happened? Revenge is not a part-timer. My bias suggests that I'm not going to say Nisham and Phillips are part-timers either. Like, they are there to bowl just as much. Like, if you're selecting this Black Caps team with a long batting lineup with Nisham coming in way down the order, like, Santner was number nine or something in this order. If that's the case, you know these lads are going to bowl, and they're not part-timers in that sense. Then, of course, Devin Conway... One of the best batters in the world right now across all three formats. Ratcha and Ravindra comes out. He blazes runs. I don't think Ratcha and Ravindra and Devin Conway are just automatically the opening combination now. 
Because Will Young strangled one down the league side, which is a niggly dismissal. It doesn't say, like, Will Young sucks. And the Black Caps came into this tournament selecting Will Young to open. Thing about Will Young is that he averages over 40 in ODI cricket and List A cricket, which only Devin Conway and Kane Williamson also do. So Will Young is good at batting. <laughs> It's not like Will Young sucks, Rajan Ravindra hit a century, he's in a bit of form, we're going to chuck him up to the open and just throw Will Young aside. Will Young, like there's four batters in the top order who average over 40 in ODI cricket. Will Young is one of them. As I said, Conway and Williamson also average over 40 in, the, in both one-day formats. Daryl Mitchell is just below 40 in list A cricket. Which brings me to like the ultimate final point. And we've covered this a few times because, like, Conway's averages are absolutely ridiculous. Daryl Mitchell's test average is almost 60. I think it's like 57 or something like that. These dudes have world-class stats. And I think this Black Caps group, whether it's, you know, Bolt, Henry and ODI Cricket, you can point to different things about different players, but just the... Like, Devin Conway is a genuine best-in-the-world batter. Kane Williamson's the best batter from Aotearoa ever. Daryl Mitchell is one of the hottest batters in the world right now, himself. Like, these dudes are putting up elite, best-ever statistics for New Zealand cricketers, let alone how they're ranked in the world. I think Virat Kohli's the only player in the world with a higher ODI and T20 average than Devin Conway. Like these dudes have scored a lot of runs and they've taken a lot of wickets, even if they are relatively new to the Black Caps. And we've said it before, I think this team is better than the 2019 team. And they showed everything. They showed great craft, they adaptability, great fielding, great athleticism, fearlessness with the bat. Everything we have come to love about the Black Caps, their identity as a Kiwi cricket team, was on show against England. That's a the 2019 versus 2023 comparison is an interesting one because um, having seen it a little clearer in this, I mean, we didn't see it fully, did we? Because we didn't get Kane Williamson in this game. So Kane Williamson hasn't played a lot of ODI cricket since the last World Cup, but I think we can safely say he's no worse than he was back then. Um, uh, Trent Bolt's no worse. Matt Henry's no worse, if not better. Uh, Mitchell Santner statistically has dropped off since the last World Cup, but you wouldn't know it from seeing him play against England. And that is one of the aspects of this is when you do compare this World Cup cycle is that the Black Caps played so little ODI cricket in, in the four years in between. And a lot of when they did play was with not necessarily all their best players uh, involved at once. Um, Tom Latham, I think, is a better ODI batter now than he was four years ago. And a better uh, wicketkeeper as well. I think Devin Conway, love a bit of uh, Martin Guptill, like, you know, love a bit of Henry Nichols too in his own way. Devin Conway is better than either of them at this point in time. Um, that wasn't like, because that wasn't Martin Guptill maybe in the previous World Cup when he was scoring a double hundred against West Indies, like at his absolute peak. That was Martin Guptill a little bit later. Um, Tim Southey wasn't necessarily first 11 then. He is now. He's come surging back at like, I think, and Daryl Mitchell, as you mentioned, has come onto the scene and been excellent just in this during this cycle in all the formats. He's he's done great, um, working his way down as well, like setting himself up as a test player, then but then sort of establishing himself as the ODI guy, and now you know he's had some nice T Twenty moments in there too, which is ironically how he started, but it's sort of the last one that he kind of uh, got nailed on. But he's he's unreal, um, and you know thing about Daryl Mitchell is who does he love playing against more than any other nation is England he didn't even have to bat in this game <laughs> you know he could have come in and scored 100 himself but he didn't even have to bat um it's yeah I, I this is why we were so sort of bullish about the Black Caps the whole time leading into this World Cup is we're, we're saying like this is we're, we're saying now I told you so basically like we're saying this is this is a strong team that has not got worse since the last World Cup that has in its own way got it maybe um because it's different it's kind of regathered a bit of the underdog status or maybe not so much underdog as the unknown status 
And Devin Conway certainly let a lot of people know who he is in a hurry. I think Rajin Ravindra even to a lot of New Zealanders. I mean, he we'd never seen that version of Rajin Ravindra before in international cricket. Well, now we have. Um, and he might not even be a first 11 dude. Like, this is, this is a good Black Caps team that absolutely should be um, setting its expectations for the semi finals and setting its hopes for winning the whole thing. And uh, the fact that people didn't have them in that bracket to start with only really said that they weren't paying enough attention. However, don't think that's the worst thing for the Black Caps. I don't think they're upset that people were writing them off going into a World Cup. I think that kind of works in their favour, frankly. A lot of New Zealand teams will say that, and it's it's always true. Uh, so that's that's beautiful. I don't, I mean... Well, I, I've got a question. What did you make of the sure. bowling performance and the just how they... Because England still put up 280, but it did feel like under par... So how did you view that bowling performance, the captaincy of Tom Latham and stuff that was happening in that first innings? Yeah, well, that's that was what I was going <laughs> to steer it back to next. So that's a nice, timely um, segue, I think. I think Latham's captaincy was outstanding. Like, the way he balanced the options was, was brilliant. I agree with the part-timer distinctions because Nisham has bowled a lot of international overs. He's taken a lot of wickets, too. He's not... And many of those have been as one of the top five bowlers. Like he's not a dude who's there. We don't know if Jimmy Nish, if Jimmy Nishan's in the lineup, he's getting overs. If Jimmy, it's it's not one of those like Glenn Phillips is a part timer. You, you'd have to say that because Glenn mind. Phillips plays and he doesn't necessarily bowl. You know, in I've this got, lineup, got... he was always likely to get overs though. Sorry, I've got Phillips bowling in every game he's playing. In, you know, I don't think that'll happen. Um, but it does depend a little bit on what they pick. Because if they're only picking three frontline bowlers, then that is the case. And I, I do think there's there's truth in that idea, but it's not truth in that the other guys are part-timers and therefore they're just like, it's, it's giving it the impression that they're just chucking the ball to anyone. I think what we had is three elite bowlers and three average kind of bowlers. You know, three guys who were sort of um, replacement level type players, to use an American phrase, as bowlers specifically. Um Glenn Phillips didn't bowl like that. Glenn Phillips came in and was and was cleaning out stumps. That was amazing. Uh, I don't think Nisham or Ravindra actually bowled fantastically, though. I mean, Ravindra getting Harry Brooks' wicket was an unreal bit of cricket because he's just like, short ball, Brook has a look at it and just eyes him up. Okay, interesting. I see where we're going with that. If you bowl it again, I'm going after it. He bowls it again. He goes after it, smacked for four through sort of like um, in front of mid-wicket. So he bowls another short one, gets smacked for four in front of mid-wicket. So he bowls another short one, gets smacked for six over top of in front of mid-wicket. So he bowls another short one. To give Ravindra the most credit we could for this, I think, did change like a nice little bit of maybe Mitchell Santner Santla influence there. He did change the line slightly, maybe a little bit more turns, and that caught the top edge. That one flies over and he's caught in front of uh, deep mid-wicket. So it's, it's, it's like... The old, uh, we'll give you 14 runs and I'll take the wicket at the end of the over kind of thing. But he was going for a boundary most overs. And it was only at the end where he sort of pulled it back to about seven for uh, when he was bowling to the tail because England were just trying to get through their, their, through their overs and taking singles at that point. Nisham wasn't, also wasn't particularly threatening. But I mean, I think a lot of that is misleading because I don't think that's how they plan to play. I think that was a specific plan for England. And in light of the fact that Saudi was out, they only really had four fit bowlers because Ferguson was also out. They decided not to pick one of those four fit bowlers. I was surprised that they didn't pick East Sodi, but I also thought like, if you're East Sodi, who's the team you least want to play against? It's probably England because they're just going to slug leg spin. Um, they, that's the kind of thing that they do. And I think the team that they picked, which had Chapman in it, which had Nisham batting at like eight, which had Satna batting at nine, was a team that said, we're just going to get through our overs and whatever you score, we're putting as much power as we can in our lineup to chase it. Like the, I think that was the plan. It's just like, it doesn't really matter how we bowl. We're just going to bowl enough. And hopefully if our top order guys, you know, top of the innings guys take some wickets, sweet as if they don't, well, if you score 350, we'll score 351. And that's how they set themselves up to do it with the deepest batting lineup they could possibly have picked. 
and they only needed three of those guys and one of them only faced one ball so <laughs> it was like they they had a they had a plan specific to england i think so anyway i think that was a specific to england and we're more likely to see Sodi coming in against netherlands tonight or you know, sounds like salvi could be back which changes things a little bit anyway and then maybe chapman drops out maybe nisham drops out who knows but um I think they had a plan specific to England and it was a plan that went all the way down their batting order and they got like 15% of the way through their plan and they'd already won and that's what they needed. <laughs> yeah, and I think that the way Ravindra and Conway played summed that up. Like they mm. they were always going to go hard. Like, And I think whoever the third, fourth and fifth bowlers, uh, fourth, fifth and sixth bowlers were, I don't think the Black Caps really cared. Like they no, were just exactly. like, we're just going to bowl our 50 overs. England's going to get whatever they want to get. Cool. We're going to chase it down. And the way Ravindra and Conway batted, they knew they were going to go hard at the top because you know you're batting all the way down to nine and 10. And that's the way the game played out. Like just that fearless spirit of hitting, of whacking boundaries from Ravindra and Conway to me epitomized the whole tactic strategy breakdown of the Kiwis against this England team. The other, another key theme we've talked about with the Black Caps is how they adapt and how they tinker for the opponents, the conditions, and of course conditions are going to vary throughout India um, with every different stadium they play in, every different region they play in. In case you didn't know, India is a massive place and they've got a wide range of conditions on offer so i am curious how that looks for this netherlands game this one is in hyderabad and the first game was in Ahmedabad. so expect a few changes to the black caps team i reckon with each of these games against the weaker nations hopefully they don't slip up against one of these weaker nations but i like, we know that wasn't the first 11 against England because Kane Williamson wasn't there, Tim Southey wasn't there. But I think, as I just touched on, I think there was a clear plan. That's I just, I don't understand the whole thing, like, oh, they use part-timers against England because I don't think they really cared. Like, they tried their best to restrict the runs, but the way this England team bats, they're always going to put up massive scores, I think, and they're... Like you're not going to restrict England for 200 off their 50 overs or even 250. Like if they're batting their 50 overs, they're going to be given 300 and nudge. And the Black Caps, their craft, their skill set was able to tie England down a little bit with wickets and some of the tactical moves. But ultimately, that bowling attack combined with the length of their batting attack, it was pretty clear to me that they were just happy to give it a crack and they gave it a crack and they were better than england in a lot of aspects of this game i don't think we should expect the same recipe against other teams especially some of these weaker teams so i'm just curious how that looks like what are they going to do how they're going to adapt what changes are going to be made and i don't think we should cling to any first 11 -y type of team at any point throughout this tournament like i just use the word first 11 like are you a first 11 talent are you a first 11 player? But I don't think we need to cling to the idea of the first 11 in this tournament because there are going to be tinker, uh, tinkering moves. There are going to be selections based on conditions and the opponent. But I think against Netherlands, hopefully, and some of these other teams, they will be eager to take 10 wickets and exert their dominance their planning their preparation on their opponent because of course net run rate does matter in a tournament like this as well and i think that was definitely front and foremost in that run chase as well the the net run rate thing the reason that like the the way that um conway and Ravindra just kept going at the same pace the whole way through tells you they did want to wipe off those runs as quick as they could. Because especially in a game like this, I think a lot of people think about net run rate as like, um, you you just win whatever way you can against the, the, like the, the rival nations of a similar level to you, but then you try beat up on the weaker teams. Which, like, yeah, but everyone tries beat up on the weaker teams. It's when you can absolutely thrash a team like England is where net run rate becomes your best friend. Because not only is ours in a great position, 
but also England's is now in a terrible position and England might well bring that back because um, that's England. Like they, we know they bat very high, although I, you know, don't love the state of that bowling lineup at the moment. We'll just, just leave that out there. You know, uh, that might be an issue because to do your net run rate, it's not just about scoring runs. It's also about taking wickets. Um, we like to the, to the point about how you play against England. Like I think you can score just like, just as many runs that England can score, you can score those runs against England's bowling attack because they don't have a Trent Bolt. Like Mark Wood bowls fast, but we saw what it, what can happen there. I don't think Rashid or Moen Ali or Liam Livingston are doing anything too crazy. Like it does seem like a little bit of a, in the same way that I am not overly impressed with like England's athleticism, I not like a. Um, I'm not overly impressed about their bowling attack. And I think that was part of it. Like the, the Black Caps, we talk about planning, preparation, tactics. You can basically see how they prepared for this game. Like we're going to give you some runs and we're, we're going to try our best in the field. We're going to try our best with our bowling attack. But we're not scared of your bowlers. And that played out. Like they whacked 283 runs at an RPO of 7.7. .7. They chased it down in 36.2 overs. They obviously weren't scared of England's bowling attack. <laughs> and the comparison from earlier about 2019 New Zealand versus 2023 New Zealand. The, the other major difference between these World Cups is that the last one was in England. This one is in India. Those are very contrasting conditions. And the Black Caps are built to handle that. I think, A, if you look at 2019 World Cup final England versus 2023 opening game of the World Cup England, England are worse. Consider it like that. That you can make a case for the Black Caps being worse, and we would disagree with that. We think the Black Caps are as good as they were then, if not even maybe slightly better, considering that they're they've got a team that has a couple more guys in form who are very good against spin and can handle the slower pitches in, in India and have experience in the IPL and stuff like this. Like they, I think our dudes are suited to make that transition. In these into these conditions i don't think england are so much but i also just think england in general are not as strong as they were four years ago i mean ben stokes has a quarter of a knee left functioning at, at this point or something you know something like that it might not even be that much of a knee it might be less than that um he's just, his knees are just like dust grinding together at this point i don't know but i mean he didn't even play this game because he was injured. What, what do you know? And then he'd come out of retirement for that too. So I, yeah, I do. You... I don't want to dig on the England because, you know, a lot of the media that we get around cricket is built from an England perspective, but um, I, I don't like, I don't want to rip on them too much for be, like Owen Morgan saying things like, well, you know, I still think uh, England can win this world cup. Like what's, what's he supposed to say? He's a, he used to be the England captain. He captained them to the last world cup. Of course he's going to say like, of course he's going to back his guys. Right. So I don't want to dig in too much, but, I think if there was delusion about how bad maybe that people thought the Black Caps would be, not not that they thought they would be bad, but just that they thought they would be a step underneath the contending category, there was a bit of delusion there. I think there's delusion about how good England are at the same time as well, particularly in Indian conditions. I'd also highlight like the Black Caps, Kane Williamson's made a miraculous recovery, right? Like Tim Salvey had a badly dislocated, fractured thumb a few weeks ago. They're fit. They're healthy. They're ready to play. Well, not, like not Williamson's not ready to play right now, but he has played games already for the Black Caps. Warm up games. Yeah, give him a week. These England players don't recover. <laughs> like Stokes has had bung knees and major issues. Like the go back to the Test series last summer. Was anyone scared about Ben Stokes bowling Neil Wagner ball? No, because he, like, he tries. But he's he's doing your workhorse stuff on two bung knees. And he's not available at the start of the World Cup. Like he hasn't made miraculous recoveries. They've got Joffre Archer as a traveling reserve, and they keep mentioning he will come into the tournament at some point. Has Joffre Archer actually returned to cricket? Because he seems to be always injured. And they were saying, like, oh, he's not going to play. <laughs> Has he in played the an ODI since the World Cup final? I don't know, but he was meant to play in the IPL and they were managing him then. Didn't play. Went back to England. Hasn't really been a factor. I don't know. 
I don't even know if he's a factor or not because I haven't seen him, to be honest. So I don't even know what's happening there. But there is a difference. Like to go with the athleticism and some of the maybe some of the practices that these teams are doing, the Black Caps are making recoveries. They are ready to play this type of cricket. The England players just seem to be always injured and they're not necessarily recovering to perform at the best of their abilities. So we'll see how that goes. We'll see how the game against Netherlands goes tonight because I did want to get a bit of mindfulness into you while you're talk comparing. Like, I just throw it up. You, you take a lot of these things deeper, but, like, the whole 2019-2023 comparison doesn't matter if they lose these next games, you know? Like, we're not going to be pondering... No, of that. course not. <laughs> we're not going to be pondering these. So it's just one game. It's the first game of the World Cup. I think we need to chill out, but... Hopefully, they defeat Netherlands and we can bask in this uh, glow for another day. The White Ferns have had two rained off T20s against South Africa. The first game, there was no play. Second game, the White Ferns, who would have thunk it? 111 for nine. If you guys like their last two, their last two T20s against South Africa, well, not last two because they have had some rain affected games in the series, but... They got rolled for less than 80 in the T20 World Cup by South Africa. Of course, coming into the series, they're talking it up, you know, every blah, blah, blah. Lots of positivity. First game of the T20 series, first action of the series, you're nine wickets down for 111. And one batter scores over 20. Kate Anderson and Bella Armstrong did play. Kate Anderson, the most dominant player in domestic cricket for the woman last summer. Obviously, they're not going to select her for the ODI team that keeps losing. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Maybe Kate Anderson should just play every game for the White Ferns. Who would have thunk it? Bella Armstrong coming in down the order. She's right, but she's, she's the same as all these other young players where they haven't necessarily sustained dominance in domestic cricket. So I don't think Bella Armstrong's going to do anything crazy. And there was no result here. So we'll see what happens in the last three games. Hopefully you get some cricket and we can actually pass out the wins and losses and performances. But for the two scheduled T20 games, so far we've got the White Ferns batting and putting up 111 runs for nine. So shout out to them. Shout out to White Ferns Cricket who... Yeah, we'll see how the rest of the series goes, but I'm not sure that their positivity and their hype for themselves is uh, being manifested on the cricket field. And I don't think that has been the case for five years, let's say that. Um, let's swing into basketball. We've got a, quite a few things happening here. The Breakers lost to the Brisbane Bullets, so I think the Breakers are now 1-1. One and one. I'll throw it over to you in a jiffy if you've got any major notes here, but I'm also curious about the Kiwis. Like, just a little scene setting for the Kiwis involved in the NBL this year. The Brisbane Bullets, did they have Tyrell Harrison? They did have Tyrell Harrison, so he is a Kiwi playing in the Brisbane Bullets team. You did highlight in our newsletter how Aaron Baines, born in New Zealand, but he's an yeah. Aussie. Tyrell has Harrison born in Australia, but he's a Kiwi. So that's happening. If if you didn't actually learn anything from the breakers, we'll keep it moving. If you did have a breakers insight, drop it. Otherwise, take us into some of the Kiwis competing in the NBL this season and some of the early form, like the biggest performers to start the campaign. Yeah, well, I think Tyrell Harrison is probably high up on that list. It is it is a strange um when I realized that it is a strange little like big man rotation that they got going there in Brisbane with the um the Aussie born in New Zealand and the New Zealand and the Portland Aussie, but it works it works quite nicely for him. And Aaron Baines is obviously, you know, big NBA experience. It's a, the right kind of guy that someone like Tyrell Harrison wants to learn off. And I think he is someone I think he's 24 years old but he's been at brisbane for quite a while he's you know a development player onto a senior contract etc um he's been there for several years and it's felt for at least the last two like he's right on the brink of a breakout season and just injuries have prevented him from being able to do that just from being able to play consistently enough um 
He started really well this season. He had, what, 12 points and eight rebounds, I think, against the Breakers. Just trying to find what he did later on against Cairns. He had uh, eight points and four rebounds with two assists in that game as well. And he's been getting blocks in pretty much every game. He's, he's doing this off the bench as well. So these aren't necessarily like... You know, the dudes coming off the bench aren't going to be the ones putting up the highest numbers. It's about putting up efficient numbers. And he's doing that. He's um, he's doing nice things. He got some good minutes against the Breakers, I think, exposing a little bit of the Breakers being perhaps, um, you know, they're giving Zylan Chiefdom a lot of minutes at the five uh, to start games even uh, through the first couple rounds. And Brisbane lent into that by saying, well, we're going to make sure we've got a big guy on the court at all times. And they did win that rebound battle. And Tyrell Harrison, I think, grabbed like five offensive boards in amongst that. So uh, he had a big impact on that game. He's had a big impact on other games. And I hope he's going to have a big impact all season because he's exactly the kind of player who would be nice if the Tall Blacks are bringing through uh, a rebounding big man at this point in time. You know, Alex Pledge has been a few years out. Um, Rob Lowe's now retired. Can't guarantee Stephen Adams is going to turn up for other things. Tyrell Harrison is... It's like it's it's good timing for him. If this is the breakout season that we've been waiting for, it's it's good timing. Um, also, though, enjoying like the the two Sams at Cairns, Meninga and Wardenberger. Both uh, Meninga still like his first game against uh, the Breakers, wasn't it? He had a really nice day. Since then, he's not had been as effective, but that's sort of like. You know, first couple of weeks as a professional, you, you you ease into things. He's shown what he's capable of already, and you know he's going to get better from there. Wardenberg's had a real tidy, um, real tidy start where he's getting just stats across the board as a big fellow. He's getting assists. He's getting you know he's hitting three pointers. Um, not as consistent a scorer as as would like, but Cairns have some you know guards who take care of a lot of that for him. So that's not necessarily what he's there to do. They've been nice. Um, so you who hasn't though is Shay Lee is <laughs> in a weird way. He's he started off, I think he shot like um two of twenty or something in his first couple games, and he was only about three of ten in the last game. So he's not making shots at the moment. But of course it's Shay Lee, so you, you know, he's still um he's still out there doing everything else that you need a guard to do and making other guys better around him. He, he's the premier Kiwi in the NBL has been for a couple of years. So don't think we got to worry about that too much. Pretty sure that shot will start dropping down the line. I don't know how long Rob Lowe's going to be with him at at Melbourne United, but because it is a little bit of a sort of swan song for him, it's the he you know coming out of retirement as an injury replacement. It's only a short term deal. As soon as Joe Luell Akil is back, then Rob Lowe returns to the um, you know fast horizons of retirement. He's been really, really good for them. Like he's just doing the Rob Lowe stuff that we saw during the New Zealand NBL. He's just continuing on that MVP stuff and the Aussie NBL. He's making shots. He's finishing around the rim. He's rebounding. He's you know sneaky good passing. He's just doing a little bit of everything for them as a big man. And I don't know if uh, you know if you're Dean Vickerman, you're probably thinking, is there a way we can convince this guy to hang around for the rest of the season? Because he definitely gives their championship hopes a boost if he's uh if he's around with them because he's been good man and it's it's just fun to watch rob Lowe play like that i don't think he always i don't well i don't think he very often in the last few years got the opportunity to to play sort of unfiltered kind of basketball just free-flowing stuff within within a system with the breakers it just i don't think they used him in quite that way it's at first for no reason at all. I couldn't figure out why they didn't seem to like Rob Lowe. Last season, it was a bit more like, you've got a 10-minute roll off the bench. You know, we we can't really give you more than that because we've got a rotation, but we'll get what we can out of you and you can understand why he ne- didn't necessarily want to return to that. Um, but he's, yeah, he's, it's all flawed for him in Melbourne. And it's it just, I just hope it can continue for a bit longer. The um, I was just thinking, like the breakers, the players who don't play are the Kiwis, you know. <laughs> they do. They are signing yes. <laughs> a, a few more Kiwis to their like a, a development contracts and stuff. But thinking back to Rob Lowe, like the dudes who don't play for the breakers are Kiwis, and the moment they go to an Australian team, they get decent roles and they perform. And funnily enough, they're good at basketball. Who would have thought? 
But that's the breakers. Yeah, I'm really waiting to see what Sam Timmons does at Sydney. He's missed the first couple of games with, I think, a calf injury, but he barely played for the breakers last year. So no surprises whatsoever that they released him. But then when they release him, he gets signed, uh, admittedly with one of their last contracts, but, you know, gets signed by the defending champions who are the only team that finished ahead of the breakers last year. Very curious to see how that goes for that experiment. Yeah. Well, I think Sam Timms is probably going to play a fair bit of basketball for the Sydney Kings. And it's like, well, I would, I would bet he plays more for the Kings than he did for the breakers last year, which I think was still double digits minutes for the season. I don't even think he got to a hundred minutes. He was playing like the similar amount to like Alex McNaught as a, dp you know and i did i did say that when the breakers like I, as much as we like seeing the breakers pick up all the development dudes and whatever i did say at the time like they, they do have a history of not playing these guys though you know they're there for a training experience they don't get a lot of minutes during games but we'll see and now there's more of them than ever so yeah haven't seen carlin davison don calman potto haven't seen uh, max darling yet mcnaught limited minutes for two limited minutes so yeah maybe there'll be some injuries there will be at some point they actually might get some good runs and against the nba teams coming up because you kind of don't want to uh you don't want to burn out finn delaney or will mcdowell white when they're playing through slight injuries at the moment and preseason games against american teams preseason yeah, so for them mid-season for the breakers which is such a weird uh, um <laughs> I'm calling it now. This is a period where we just like tune out of breakers and we just focus on the Kiwis and the NBL while the breakers are on their world tour. <laughs> yes. We well, did have yeah. a uh, Stephen Adams commercial, which was pretty cool. He's uh, got a little milk deal and it's a typical Stephen Adams comedy. Stephen Adams also appeared on the uh, media day for Memphis Grizzlies and as the author of the Stephen Adams quotable yarn every year were there any like, i don't care about his knee like whatever he's going to say some shit about his knee he's going to be available he's going to try whatever i don't want any quotes about his knee i'm curious about like funny quotes from stephen adams at media day if there are some drop them if not we'll move it forward because no one no one's here for the serious stephen adams quotes I don't know. The quotables does have a few serious ones. He's he may be a joker, but he's also very good at like explaining basketball in simple terms. Yeah, but I don't want um, that here. You know, like I'm here uh, for life. Luckily, those tend to be paragraphs, and I can't remember them, so you know, I can't I can't do that. Um, but I did. I I was sort of heartwarmed by a lot of that stuff where they were um, discussing the knee like it's made progress and he's ready to go and since then he's been appearing seemingly unchecked and like um you know some sort of as they call them scrimmage games and stuff like inter-squad friendlies and and whatever uh one of which had media access and so there was a shot of him throwing down a little corner three which is the annual stephen adams tradition of pretending he's going to start shooting three pointers which usually only happens in his is sort of like his own off-season work but very occasionally he did hit one for OKC in his last year in a preseason game. Um, not going to happen. You know, it's, it's not going to be something that becomes a regular in real games, though. I I don't know. I, I don't think I could name a specific quote, but I think the thing I enjoyed the most was um, the interactions with his teammates. Like, just like there, there was one where Luke Kennard was doing an interview and he yells something else something out like off mic sort of or off camera just butting in and him and jaron jackson jr seem to have a pretty funky relationship and just a lot of that stuff where it's like seeing how beloved he is to his teammates but also in a way where they're like yeah i love this guy and also he's an amazing basketballer who makes us play so much better because of all the things that he does um just that general vibe of steven adams being back with the team the team absolutely not taking that for granted in any way and just everyone seeming to enjoy themselves. It, it lends it all towards like a, um, a promising start for the season to for the Grizzlies, which I think they need because on the one hand, they don't have Ja Morant for the start because he'll be suspended because he can't control himself. Um, but they will have Steven Adams back. So they'll be having a little run. And there, was, there have been times in the past two years where Morant's missed extended time through injury or suspension. And uh, one of them... Stephen Adams did play when Morant was out injured for about a month in the first season. Adams was playing throughout that. There was also the time last year where Morant was suspended, but Adams was injured. So Adams wasn't playing. 
the time when Morant wasn't there, but Adams was, they kept winning throughout. Like they had a fantastic record and people were starting to talk about that. Like, well, I guess we can't think of Ja Morant as an MVP candidate because his team still wins without him, blah, blah, blah. When Adams wasn't there and Morant wasn't there, they just lost all the time. Eventually started to bring it back around a little bit by the end of it. They started, they used that time to figure out a ways to get Jaron Jackson Jr. to be their main man. But the trend was still clear. Like Adams without Morant, they can still be a pretty, like it's flawless, um, nothing needs to change. We can still win plenty of games of basketball kind of mentality. No Adams and no Morant. That took a lot of adjustment, you know? And they will have Adams without Morant to start the season. Everyone else seems to be pretty happy about that. It seems like he's, hope- well, they might manage him through preseason, but it'll be like Kane Williamson at the World Cup. You know, when he's good, to- when he needs to be there, he'll be there. That's, that's what we can ask, you know? That's what we can ask is Stephen Adams back on a basketball court and not but... selling milk, although that was a nice little addendum as well. Yeah, well... The season doesn't start for a few weeks, so we're just basking Stephen yeah. Adams uh, blocking kids' shots while holding a bowl <laughs> of milk. Uh, football, Tyler Binden scored a goal for Reading, which is uh, pretty cool for him. Recent all-white. I was watching your little clip of it, and I was like, okay, cross comes in. It's going to be Tyler Binden who heads it into the bottom corner, but that shot goes off the post. And then it's Tyler Binden who slips over, nudges it into the far left corner. As you said, precise finishing from Tyler Binden. Is he playing right back for Reading in this? So he... Uh, yeah, he has, he has been. He originally, he's more of a centre back and he was originally playing centre back for them, but then he missed some time with concussion and he's come back in and got a spot at right back instead. So you know, good versatility. So is, is he forecasting as a centre back, right back for the All Whites and then you've got Matt Dibley Diaz as a central midfielder for the All Whites? Is that how you More or less, that? yeah. So uh, I've like been that. down I the like line that. will definitely be a CB for the, for the All Whites, but I'll just say, you know, there's no Tim Payne on this tour. There's no Callan Elliott on this tour. There's no Storm Rue or Dane Ingham on this tour. There's kind of just Nico Kerwin, who had his very serious knee injury last uh, last year, almost, almost all of his season. His backs are playing regularly now, but he does seem to be in and out of the starting lineup a little bit for his Padova team, and that's Italian third tier. So that's not much different to English third tier. Um, what I'm saying is there's an opening at right back if Tyler Binden wants to get in there in the in the here and now. Even I could see that that was happening. So I'm expecting Tyler Binden. Watch out for him. He scored a goal for Reading this weekend on the Flying Kiwis Trail. Now he goes into All Whites football, possible starting right back for the All Whites if he is to make his debut. Um, I imagine Matt Dibley Diaz isn't playing a whole lot for Fulham in the Premier League at the moment. Was he on the bench for this weekend's games? Uh, no, he hasn't been on the bench since week one, but I think that was because week one was before the under-21 started, and since then, he's basically, they've just been prioritizing. You go play for the under-21s, you captain them, you be their best player every week, see how it goes, and then when someone gets injured, you come into our team kind of thing. And So that hasn't happened again yet. He's had three substituted appearances, well, not appearances, but he's had three times on the bench in the wider squad uh, in his career so far. Waiting on that fourth one, but it will happen. It will come at some point. Which brings us to National League football. What's your what's your big things things? You can go singular, you can go plural, but we just need a big thing from the National League football this weekend. Um, you've got a couple of clips out live. Goal from Charlotte Lancaster. Who so I imagine. To a, I imagine the way you tweeted that out that she used to play for the wellington phoenix reserves and now she's scoring goals against them so that was quite pretty cool of course we're putting those clips out on our twitter feed and on instagram the best of which will pop up on youtube as well what's your big thing from the national league over the weekend well with charlotte lancaster she used to play for the phoenix but she used to play for the phoenix before they had a reserves team of course right so she was a scholarship player um for two years, I think. It's a scholarship year, player both years. And, um, you know, someone who would have benefited a lot from having a reserve team to drop down and play and get some minutes for didn't get that opportunity until after she'd been released. But then first time she gets to play against that reserve team that she never got to play for, scores a couple bangers, there you go. 
Um, nobody kicks the ball harder than Charlotte Lancaster. So if you, if you this sometimes to her detriment because she tries shots from like 30 meters out, which no one else in the Women's National League is really that keen on. Uh, but she'll absolutely thump them. But she'll also, because she's thumping them from a mile out, she'll usually miss the target. Um, here are a couple examples where she did hit the target. And when she hits the target, you're not saving them. So um, she's a very fun player to watch. Uh, it's popping up at Eastern Suburbs now. Very interesting. Um, good progression for her too in that way, because she normally had been playing for Central. Um, Central did get a nice result on the weekend, though. I think the big thing would have to be something to do with two goal comebacks in the men's thing amongst the contenders because you had Wellington Olympic just got dug themselves into a fair bit of trouble against Kashmir Tech. Were they, were they three nil down or three one down? Um, they were at least three one down. I think it might have been two nil, two one, three one, and then they came back to draw three all and yeah, might have had some chances to to win that. It was a hell of a comeback either way, and then. The next day, well, actually on the same day, you had uh, the opposite sort of thing where Christchurch United, who I think are also in that sort of um, contender status at this point, but of course, Wellington Olympic were a finalist last year. Christchurch United turned all up against, uh, who were they playing? Um, Auckland United, wasn't it? They were turned all up, just as they were turned all up in the uh, Chatham Cup final. And this time, just like the Chatham Cup final, they couldn't hold on. It didn't quite take a goalkeeper in the last seconds of the of the game to equalize, but they did fall back to a two or draw. Well, bang of goals in that one as well. Um, Owen Stokes and also Yusuf Al Khaleesi. I think Yusuf Al Khaleesi has been absolutely fantastic for Auckland United in all three of these games. Um, this was probably the worst of his three performances, and he scored one of the goals of the week. So Christchurch United went the opposite in that they blew a two-goal lead. Uh, Wellington Olympic had to come back from from down to to get a point in their game. And then on the Sunday, Auckland City, believe it or not, just before halftime, they're 2-0 down against uh, Napier City Rovers. And the first goal was a beautiful free kick from Derry Corf, English import. Second one was from also an Englishman, but I think someone who's been here a lot longer is Liam Schofield chipping the goalkeeper from about... 35 metres out. Another couple of fantastic goals from Napier. 2 0 up against Auckland City after about half an hour. Uh, how long can you hold on to that against Auckland City? Because the issue with Auckland City is when it's nil all, sometimes you can just keep them at nil all for a long time because they'll just pass the ball around and, and bore everyone to death with their precision uh, technical football. When they're 2 0 down, they don't have a choice but to up the tempo and really go for it. So they did. Angus Kilcolly scores just before the half, uh, and they carried on from there and ended up winning 4 2. So Auckland City were 2 0 down, but came back to win. Wellington Olympic had to settle for a draw, having been two goals down, and Christchurch United were two goals up and also had to settle for a draw. So some wild comebacks going on in the men's national league. I think Canterbury also scored late against Central and the women's to, to salvage a. A point in that one, there was, yeah, you know, the week before we had defending champs in the women's comp, Eastern Suburbs, 2-1 down against Auckland United after about 75 minutes, something like that. They came back to win 3-2. Some of these some of these contests, man, I tell you, we do get some games, especially in the women's comp now and then. Like there was first game of the season was an 8-0 win for Springs over Central. You also get some absolutely like uh, very close arm wrestle back and forth contests too. It uh, gives you a bit of everything. The National League. Who? Any? I just want to know the best players. Like who's rising up your your rankings as some of the men's best players? Because you do you do your men's team of the week for our Monday newsletter, then you do the women's team of the week for the Friday newsletter. So it's probably a good time coming on a Monday. Just updating, like, who are some of the best players in the Premier League, specifically players that we're watching out for to move to a higher level from New Zealand? Yeah, um, yeah, I, I have, I've had a lot of love for the Auckland United uh, sort of creative pairing of Yusuf El Khaleesi, who I mentioned before, but also Dre Vollenhoven, who both of them are ex-Auckland City players, um, Al Khaleesi is a Kiwi Iraqi and Vollenhoven is a Kiwi South African. So there's a you know bit of bit of that going on. And Vollenhoven is a good left foot, number 10, sits in behind, just makes things happen. He can dribble, he can shoot, he can pass, all that kind of uh, you know, variety of creativity. He wasn't at his best. He was subbed off a little early in the Christchurch United game, but he's 
really good in the two games prior and he'll have plenty of uh, starring shows down the line. Another Kiwi South African who had a great game on the weekend was Lyle Matheson for, for Cashmere Technical. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. You might have to throw out some teams if I'm going to pick out players out of the air, though. Um, or I can wait for the app to eventually load. Um, but obviously, like, if you you know, if I'm picking an MVP after three weeks, I'm looking towards Jack Henry Sinclair. And if you're picking a player who deserves a professional opportunity, having been at an MVP caliber at this level for several years, it's also Jack Henry Sinclair. I think that answer probably hasn't changed from the last couple of years. Is he like a, is he still in like a wing back type of role? Is he? More or less. Um, he, but the way Wellington Olympic play is their wing backs are basically just wingers. Like, do you get the, it's a lot more wing than it is back. You know, they, they play higher up than the midfielders rather than level with the midfielders, like a lot of wing backs would do. Uh, that's just Wellington Olympic being really fast and really dynamic and really attacking. But, you know, it's at a higher level, yeah, you'd, you'd probably have to shape that as more of a wing back uh, specific role. But, no doubt that Jack Henry can do that. Beauty. So stay tuned for any further National League content. As we just said, the team of the week for the men will be named in our Monday newsletter coming out tonight. And then, of course, there will be the big deep dives for the round of footy as well. Big up yourself. Love yourself. We'll be back on Thursday with another episode of the Niche Cast. Stay tuned for the subscriber podcast that we will be doing on Wednesday about Black Caps cricket and anything else that our homies want us to talk about. Kia kaha, stay beautiful, a church. Hey.